is a good night for us to uh, do some Parmenides. Yes. Sir. Right? Because the group, yeah. the Parmenides yeah. group is all here. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, So, um, just to go back over it for a moment, would you agree that in the first hypothesis we find a series of arguments that take this form? There's an argument about the one. When he finishes it, there's a conclusion about the self. This goes on, it is said, the same development goes on Fourteen times. Right. Next. But each of the arguments, or each argument, does not appear to follow its subsequent or its prior. <clears throat> so that, as a whole, it is rational but in terms of developmental logic or reason, it is irrational. Right? That is saying that this sequence, sequence on the nature of the one, conclusion about the self, That is to say, each of these arguments, while each can be considered rational, that is to say, it has its own logic, has its own principles, that the connection between these does not follow. Therefore, 
each subsequent argument and its prior may be rational, within itself, it lacks coherence and since it lacks coherence it can be said not as a whole to be rational. All right. Agree? Now, uh, I really don't know what we would do in the game of philosophy had it not been for Proclus. Right? Because this is a dialectic. This is really a dialectic. But it appears to be lacking coherence and intelligibility. Right, so this is said to be a dialectic. A dialectic must have a purpose. Therefore, the purpose is indeed a mystery. But Proclus comes along and he says, look here, all of this is true. If you check each one of these conclusions, those conclusions follow which are based upon a uh, metaphysical sequence of arguments descriptions of the gods and or the order of the gods. Okay. So if that's true, then for each of these conclusions, we should find a metaphysical description of one of the gods or the order of the gods, so that this in fact is, a, is in fact a dialectic, but it's a dialectic on the self and the gods. Because what he's doing is saying, you know what, the idea of the self is independent, and though it has its influence on all of these arguments and all of these following theological points, it's in fact a defense of the self and positioning the gods in their hierarchy Right? in their hierarchy
that matches the metaphysical consequences that follow in each of the 14 arguments. So therefore, it is a dialectic on the self and the gods, and they're a hierarchy. Now, there's several things that are going to occur, because if you decide to do this, uh, you're going to go into an area that is pretty remote to us, because you can only follow it by taking on Proclus's theology of the God, a theology of Plato. All right? So to decipher this, Now, what's interesting about the title, you see, that's exactly what he's saying the Parmenides is. It's a theology of the gods. It's, a, it's, it's in fact a theology of Plato's view of the gods. But you have to add to it. Now, the, the only real curious question is, uh, would this be obvious to the Greeks at the time? We have to pull out Proclus's theology of Plato and decipher it. By the way, it's much better than some of his other works uh, in terms of readability. But... Uh, Were the, were the intellectual Greeks at that time, could they spot these 14 conclusions and say, oh yeah, oh yeah, I know what he's doing, oh yeah, oh yeah, and fit it in? But we don't have that culture, and that's what the theology of Plato does from Proclus, he gives us the culture, and that's its role. So, why don't we just go through the first argument, right, and then take a look at it, all right? Couple of readers, what do you say? We're talking first hypothesis? Right. I'll read. Yeah. What's the final of that one? Uh, I think it's 137C5, maybe? Or C3, something like that. 137C. Am I reading the oh, number wrong? Okay. No, it's By the way, for those of, uh, of us who don't know, I've just posted uh, Balboa's latest version of the Parmenides on the archive. So if you want to know what the website is for that, let me know. I'll tell you on the side. But it's got um, a bunch of their latest corrections and Stephanus numbers and Parmenides paragraph numbers. So if you don't have a copy, go, feel free to download it. Mm -hmm. So this is newer than the one you made put the numbers in on? Not the same one. Oh, oh just good. Just for those of us who don't. Oh, got it. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I'm pretty sure I'm seeing Okay, Barbara? Yeah. Oh. Eldar, want to play? Uh, sure. Well then, if one is, could not the one be many in some other way? How could it be many? Accordingly then, Neither can the, any part belong to self, nor can self be a whole. Why not then? Well then, that's your conclusion.
right? And the it's is going to be picked up with the word self, right? Mm -hmm. So, neither can any part belong to the self. Ah, nor can the self be a whole. Can the self be a whole? Now, I want to give you guys a couple of problems with this, all right? Um, Is, is this the way to, is, now, we know that he uses the idea of self with uh, self-justice, uh, self-parmenides, self-logos, So therefore, what do you think of this? Should it be, nor can any self part? Come on, take a look. Definitely self part belong to the self. Okay, look here. Here's my question. I think so. Meros is part. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can you look up Meros and see what the nominative form is? Auto. The auto is the word being translated itself. You'll see out that in the Greek text, should your eyes wander across. A-U-T-O. Mm -hmm. and A-U-T-O-U. Meros part share a portion. So Meros is a nominative form? Yeah. Hmm. Meros. Well, it says Meros. E-O-S is the first form. Arms. Well, it contracts, I think. Okay. Now, you would agree, in terms of the game, he can put next to each one of the so-called ideas. Agree? Agree, yeah. All right, look here. Um, Did he need to say this? If he says that the self can only be a whole, nor can the self be a whole, he's excluded. If he excludes the idea of whole, would he not, did, would he need to say, nor can any part belong to the self? Why do you think not? Yeah. No. I would think not. Well, if you can't be a whole, whole is that from which no part is lacking. So if it can't be a whole, shouldn't one shouldn't have to say that there is no part that belongs to it. And if it can right. say there's no parts, you don't need to say it can't be a whole. Thank you. So therefore, there's a mystery here, there isn't there? Hmm. It's hey, it's redundant. Why did Why did he bring it up? Right. Thank you. <laughs> now, it all goes back to this statement, you see. 
Now, um, well, wait a minute. To be fair, you know. I'll wait a minute. No, I'm I, waiting a minute. Uh, I'm waiting a minute. Oh. Okay. During that time, I'm going to be talking. <laughs> and I was saying that it could be an incomplete self that has parts. But by saying a whole, he's saying, and it will never be a one. It will never be a... Because a whole implies some one. Come on. Imperfect and perfect. Can you say that more? Again, Come on. Julie? I hope so. <laughs> um, I said he could have an incomplete self that has parts, but not all the parts are there. How can you have an incomplete whole? Sure. Could the one be a many in some other way, in some curious way? Could the one be a many? Yeah. That's his opening statement. This is the way he answers it. That's one way it could be many, as if it were a whole. But he's rejecting it. He's rejecting it. Right. How could it be many with a whole when you say it? Okay. All right. Here, let me give you a problem. Um, let, let, me, let me jump to this. Uh, one expression, and then we'll go back to this problem and right after that. Uh, in itself and in another. Would you agree that's the next conclusion? Right. Look here. Hey. Um. Or never anywhere. Okay, look here. Let me, let me push something for you. Um. Zeus. All right. Whatever he is, very clearly within himself, there are these ideas. All right? Now look here, whatever you possess is independent of you. You in some way bring it to yourself and you think you, be you belong to it or with it. So therefore, if, there, if Zeus is focusing on his own mind, this is the mind, this is mind itself. This is the intelligible paradigm. Right? These are the ideas. This is the idea of the good. These are all the ideas. All right? Now watch. Since these are within him, then he possesses them. Whatever you possess is independent and must be prior to you and have its own existence. Therefore, this must exist independently of him. Ah, well then, there's something that's rather curious because this idea in itself and another <clears throat> represents these ideas in Kronos. But Kronos is said to, to be in itself and he is in another, in Zeus. So it's called in itself and in another. Therefore, a Greek looking at this <clears throat> conclusion in itself and another could easily recognize Kronos. Mm, uh, why is it in itself? I can see that in another, but 
Uh, why is it in itself? Because you can talk about something independently of what's in it. You can talk just it, just what it is. And therefore you can say, in itself, is, that's what he is. Mm. But there's also, oh. there's another property of Kronos, and that is to understand it, this is the father and son relationship. Therefore they are joined in a paternal relationship. So right. is in itself like, uh, that's its nature? Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah. Whether it has a nature, but you have the right idea. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Now look here. Proclus is, is saying that uh, uh, Zeus, therefore, is a totality. of the ideas. Right? More than that, therefore, he is a pure whole. Right? Hey. If he's a pure whole, <clears throat> if that's the way he can be understood metaphysically, then going back now to this curious expression that we have here, is there a way of translating this so that it might fit what we're describing about the nature of Zeus? That's the issue. Got it? Since you agree it's superfluous in the everyday world, but it must make some sense to them. Well, could you say that no part belongs to self, which means that you can't say that one of those elements in Kronos would belong to the self. You can't just say it's beauty or justice if you want to talk about them as parts. Um, well, but how will that help us with our question? I thought you said... How what? Could, Do it again. How could it be translated? You want actually a translation of it or, or how it could be understood as in, what, in a certain way? Yeah, but the test is whether we can use it to help understand the idea of Zeus. The idea of Zeus? Oh, well, I was thinking that if you understood Kronos and Zeus, you could say that you can't have, you can't just call it justice. That would be a part that would belong to self, but wouldn't be the whole of self. But we need to find something that can make, is there another way of reading this that might then be translated as a description of Zeus? That's the issue. So the same way. You don't think that I, in the same way that the Cronus is in Zeus, that that could be a part that belongs to Zeus? Because I thought you were using the language of possess. Yes. But I might have, it, you know, literally, it's nor can any, nor can, and nor can there be any part of self. That's all. That's just right. You can definitely say that. That's easy. Because this is inferred, belong to. Right. Right. The verb um, belong to is um, a way of capturing the genitive. But literally, I mean, simply, it's just a part of self. So in a way, you were asking earliest whether it was a self part. Look, can any part, can any part, um, to the self? To the self? 
Okay, look, that's assuming uh, like if he only had the ani here, it would fit. Right? Yeah, it's actually necessity, nor must any part be of self, and that's understanding the verb to be, nor can self, oh no, there is an ani. I imagine it could go with both. Where's my Greek? There is an anine. That's it. What are you going to do with the anine? Mm -hmm. Let's put it to be. I would, what? To be self. Yeah. Yeah. But I want it in the first line. I gotcha. I'm going to just check there. Okay, here's my question for you. Is it legitimate, David, and, the, and Greek to see this as parallel constructions so that whatever is being said in the one can be inferred from the other? You mean relation to uh, part or whole? Okay, let me give you the, the reason. When he has to be ani, nor can the self be whole, can that assume, nor can any part be the self? Right. But he doesn't do it but it, uh, with part okay. of the cell. Is there any way you can play around with this top phrase and offer any other alternative solution? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. In the background, let me tell you the issue. Okay, what's the issue? <clears throat> If Proclus is right, and we can understand the idea that Zeus is considered to be the, the whole of all wholes, or, or the whole, meaning the whole of all wholes. Each of these is a whole, and this is the whole of all wholes. But that would make Zeus the Demiurgos, or what we're going to call this. It's going to make Zeus the idea of the good. Or... The brilliant light of being. Yeah, or being. That's quite right. Or being. You mean Cronus, right? Well, uh, just as a quick note, Ani is at the end of the sentence in, in the Greek. So it could reflect both part and whole. It could go back to both of those since it's neither nor. But it's meros autu, well, olo auto, de ani. So it's not in, in, in Balboa, it's not between self and whole, but it's actually at the end. Nor can any part be self. Or whole. Well, then the next line. Or whole. No. You can put them together. Well, I just don't want to do that yet. Uh, look, let me do it again, okay? Proclus is saying the totality, the whole, is Zeus. No? Not if this is Zeus. Now here's the next problem. The figure of Zeus appears in the mythology and the mythology and the theology of Plato. <clears throat> this is why this word is so important.
right? They're different. That means that you can take the, uh, what are called ancosmic gods, or uh, I think another translation would be the mundane gods, These 12 gods can also appear in other orders of the gods. Many of the gods and the encosmic gods or mundane gods, they can be distributed in different ways among the different orders of gods. So, Proclus has this problem. As you look at the different ways in which Zeus may appear, among the order of gods, is it possible that there is one place where he can be talked about as the whole of all wholes, or the totality, or the total? If so, we win. See what it takes? It takes two separate steps. Now, uh, it's only by reasoning this way that you can finally say that what he's addressing is of the nature of Zeus. But you said it was two steps, and I, I fear I only thought one of them, that we want to see if there is a place where Zeus is described as a whole of holes, right? What was the other thing we needed to see? What was the other step? Because you said there were two. Well, I'm not following your point, so... Oh, no, it's a question. I didn't hear... I, I, didn't hear the distinction about the first step we'd have to have in order to put Zeus in as the whole of holes. Yeah. The second part I got. The yeah. First part. yeah, hold it. I'm saying that there's a problem in putting Zeus here. Right. Because right. that's being or the idea of the good or whatever other expression we're going to use to describe it. Right? Therefore, it doesn't fit. However, Proclus makes, makes it very clear that there's a difference between these two kinds of categories. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what he's really doing is not just the gods, he's in this, the order of the gods. So we, essentially we want to find an order where Zeus is described as the whole of holes. Right. One of the orders. Right. Yeah. Okay? Right. And we'll have to do that with each one of the conclusions. Ah. See, find a description of one of the gods or part of the ordering that matches. Right. Right. So, look. Try the next one. Watch. It goes on. Let's read to seven. Okay, read it aloud. But it must indeed not be many, but oneself. Go to the next one? No, no. Stay there. Okay. No. We're going from uh, two to six. Oh, sorry? Parmenides. Two to six. Oh, read the two, two to Please six. Please do okay. it. Gotcha. Accordingly, well, we just read that. Well, accordingly then, neither can any part belong to self, nor can self be a whole. Why not then? Because the part is in some way a part of a whole. Yes. What then about the whole? Would not that from which no part is absent be whole? Entirely so. Accordingly then, 
From both these consequences, the one would be composed of parts, by being a whole and by possessing parts. Necessarily. Accordingly then, in both ways, the one will be many, but not one. True. But it must indeed not be many, but one self. It must. Pierre? Yep. Two seven, right? Not sure. Okay. Um. What? Eight is the conclusion of the argument. Okay, keep going just for a couple of steps. Watch seven. It will be I mean, whole. six, pardon me. Um, we hit seven. Go ahead. Keep going. But it, hence, it will neither be a whole nor possess parts if the one is to be one. It will not. Is it not the case then that if it can have no part, then neither can it have a beginning, nor middle, nor end? For such as those would already be parts of self. Rightly so. And certainly the beginning and end are indeed the limit of each part. How could they not? Accordingly then, the one is unlimited, if it has neither beginning nor end. Unlimited. Accordingly then, it must also be without figure. We stop it there. Okay. Um. Okay. Um, in um, 145, you, you always have to keep together 145 and 148 okay. in process elements of the elements of theology. Anybody bring it? I didn't. No. Okay. Every divine order has an internal unity of threefold nature. Threefold origin, I think. From its highest right, or origin, right. All right, now look here. In this discussion, it centers around beginning, middle, and end. Look here. Every divine order Order of the gods. One forty five. Every divine order has an internal unity of threefold origin. Uh, he's, he's telling us, is he not? <clears throat> that when we're going to be talking about divine orders, that they have an internal unity. Every, see, here's a whole bunch of divine orders. Each one of them has a threefold origin where he's going to distinguish beginning, middle, and end in that order. All right? That's what he's going to do. Um, therefore, the order of the gods is most likely
are the hey, are the fourteen different orders of gods, or whatever gods he then selects, can we collect them um, as, among threes? Same thing. Or can we collect them among threes? Three to reflect here. Pardon? The three would reflect beginning, middle, and end, or what? Yes. Okay. Well, yeah, each one has a threefold origin, right? right and that right, has right. to be there. And he talks about them as if they are nothing other than mean analogies. Exactly so, yeah. Right? Because that's the internal order. Yeah, the, especially the middle term yeah, has yeah, that. Yeah. So these orders must themselves be. Uh, mean analogies. Now, among the different orders of gods, is it possible that one is considered primary? Can these be in a hierarchy? If so, then see, he has different different orders of the gods and uh, we can have uh, um, Zeus, Hephaestus, uh, and uh, what's, the, what's the name they go for Pluto? Um, Hades. Huh? Hades. Pardon? Uh, Pluto in no. Greek? Hades. Hades. I, I don't know. Okay, I'll use that. Okay. Or is that another one? Well, the brother. Yeah, okay. Now, this is a threesome. The sign. Right? Now, if there are th threesome, they have to match, they have to match the mean analogies. Right? Whatever order you get, and there are different sets of threes that are considered primary within the ranks of one of the orders of the gods. So, when any three you get, you have to consider it as a mean analogy, right? It must follow the same logic as 145, which it does, by the way. That is, the way they, these gods relate to one another on this hierarchy, you'll see, oh, this is the way they relate. All right, going one more. Um, no, no, that, no, let me hold there. Okay, some questions before we push it? Yeah. Uh, is this, um, this question is coming a bit late, but is this uh, saying that each one of the 14 arguments can be taken as a triad? Uh, no, not, that's one of the possibilities. Well, okay. Right. But in any case, there has to be 14 distinctions among the gods, whether, they take, whether we're taking them in terms of the threes or individually. Right? Look, it could be, see, it could be a combination of these two.
but um, it says that every divine order has an intellectual. So, wouldn't that mean that each one of them would be? A well, you see, in the uh, uh, in what are called the cosmic gods or the mundane gods. Um, they have three triads and then they have uh, protective gods which are themselves a triad so therefore you have three order, you have one order with three triads and a triad bringing them and saving, keeping them together and protecting them, or four, right? Okay, so, um, Let's take the last one, all right? Hermes, uh, uh, Aphrodite, and uh, Apollo. All right? Now, if that is a threefold, if that is a threefold, in, and they have, if this order has a threefold order, then they must stay together as a mean analogy. So the qualities that must take place between them must match 145, which is the logic of the mean analogy. All right. Hermes is said to be the principal philosophy. Aphrodite is beauty and therefore philosophy is the love of, right? It, therefore philosophy needs beauty for it to be an object of love since philosophia is the love of philosophy or love of Sophia. Therefore there has to be a beauty at the root of it. And Apollo uh, must take the philosophy that emerges and he is the, the uh, um, know thyself. Okay. So philosophy finds beauty in its inner workings as it explores know thyself and therefore these three fit in a triad. Right. Now, he can do that, he can do that with these, these sets, with these, and it's fun to do, we did one, all right? Uh, but why are you doing this? We're trying to introduce you to the ideas of Proclus. Because look here, he's saying this kind of reflection must be assumed when you're looking at each of the each of the propositions, pardon me, each of the arguments in the first hypothesis, in order to see that the conclusions that are reached can be understood metaphysically, and metaphysically they should be able to describe each of the gods or the order of the gods, and it's a perfect unity. That's what he's arguing for. Wow. Okay. A lot of fun? Yeah. That's where we're going. Okay. I don't see how, how it relates. What? I don't see how it relates to Parmenides. The, um, but I'll wait to see. No, no. You're right. You don't see it. But you do, do you understand what we have said about it? Yeah. And then that's all you need. Okay. Right. So let me raise this question to our group. 
Um, I think it's uh, time to, to go into Proclus's mm -hmm. theology, theology of Plato. Oh, Since theology. we're sufficiently familiar with the arguments, each of you should have the conclusions. That's why I need the conclusions. Mm -hmm. Or we can spend a little more time on conclusions if you want. But you'll, either way. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good to me, yeah. Take a break. Yeah. All right, let's take a break and think about it and let me know. And remember the idea was to go backwards. From seven, yeah. So from Thomas Taylor's work. Yeah, only. I don't know if you followed here the series of emails. I emailed um, Juan and Maria about what Greek text they were planning to use and whether they had it for the theology. I know. Um, no, no, that. I haven't heard it. Oh, okay. Well, the answer is they have the seven-volume Buddha. You know, yeah, the French. Okay. French Greek, yeah.